go. Is my record button. You've got red uh, dot going. You've got speed and yep. You got red Time dot and you hear audio, right? Second, I do have one channel of audio being sent to you. Yep, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Perfect. I'm recording on our end as well, Jason. So okay, good. Okay. Whenever you're ready. <coughs> Fantastic. Okay, everybody, quiet, please. Corbin, how are we doing audio? We're fine. Okay. One, go. two. Here's audio. Thank you. <laughs> Sit up. Get my air in my <coughs> diaphragm. Right. Go, go ahead. Let's do it. Okay. So uh, uh, what I'd like to do is um, uh, just a nice conversation. We talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about kind of your your getting started, but obviously we really want to get into the meat and potatoes of the film and what it what it stands for for what it what it meant to you and what it what it stands for now. Uh, and uh, well, let's start off with uh, tell us your name and uh, and what you do and what you're currently doing now. My name is Dale Bell. I am a filmmaker, proudly. And I am still a filmmaker, somewhat proudly, you know, not exclusively proudly. It's a little bit more troublesome. Let's let's talk a little bit about your a uh, little bit about your past. It's not. I don't want to uh, take up too much time, but I, I want to. I really want to get to some of uh, uh, some credentials, if you would. Uh, so tell us a little bit about where you get started in filmmaking and uh, and, and where you are today. <laughs> I graduated college speaking four languages. By the time I'd finished college, I'd produced 26 plays. I wanted to get into film. Tor Heyerdahl of Contiki fame was my mentor. I read his book, I saw his movie, and I said to myself, I want to do what he does. I want to be that man, I want to work with that man. Lo and behold, if you wish things long enough, hard enough, and you do things, you eventually may get to actually be the person you want to become. So when I graduated college, I couldn't get any work. I worked in the shipping room at ABC Television in New York, but I really wanted to get into what was then educational television. So in 1964, there was an opportunity that was given to me by a person who was joining public television or educational television for the first time. He had seen me come into the ABC Live Studios on November 23rd, Saturday at 6 o'clock in the morning and watch the feeds that were coming in from all over the world about JFK's assassination. And there were a lot of people huddled around this 50 monitors, all black and white, and somebody said, what's Charles de Gaulle saying? And I was speaking four languages at the time. I became a simultaneous translator for the French, the Spanish, the Italians, and the Russians as they were speaking about JFK's uh, assassination. And of course, I was incredibly moved. Bill Weston, the guy, would hire me in March of 1964 uh, to join educational television. And I've never looked back. That allowed me to really hone my skills as a filmmaker and a multitasker because I would learn writing, I would learn budgeting, I would learn technology, I would learn different kinds of productions. I would be film, I would be videotape, I would be live, I would be interconnected, I could handle a small group, I could handle a large group. And so at the end of this decade, this tumultuous decade of the 1960s, I had an opportunity in July of 1969, when I was out of work, to join a team and eventually to lead that team at Max Yasger's farm, where Woodstock, the festival, and I became one of the two producers of the film because of what I had learned in educational television. And half the team that worked with me over those three days and would later work with me over the next eight months as we made the finish, finish the film were all people from educational television. So I loved it. I loved the realm of ideas. I loved the culture. I loved the, the history that we were able to capture. And what I was really trying to do with my life was to be an anthropologist, if you will, with a camera as my tool. Gordon Parks, who I gave his first job to as a director in 1967 when I was filming in Harlem, 
uh, was my, another one of my many, many, many mentors. But Gordon and I slaved over a camera in, uh, in Harlem in 1967, right after the riots. I gave him his first job as a, uh, as, a, a camera, as a film director. He would later become the first black person hired by a major studio as a director of a major film. So there was a lot of quid pro quo that was going on in the trenches of New York in the 60s. Amazing. Um, let's let's jump ahead to uh, what gave you the idea. What what prompted the idea of, of doing a documentary on Hokulea? Like, where did that? I mean, you're here. You're talking about being in New York and Harlem. Where did this idea come from? Well, I'm not going to take credit for being the person who said let's do a film about Hokulea, but I'll give you a little bit of history. Herb Connie the painter was trying to find his way back to his own culture. He was slaving over a canvas, many canvases, in Chicago, in an apartment, trying to pick up enough work so that he could stay alive and try to inch his way back into Waipio Valley and Big Island. He got a couple of contracts from some shipping companies to maybe look back on the Hawaiian culture maybe look back on what Hawaiians had originally done, what Polynesians had originally done to come to Hawaii in the first place. That enabled him to begin his research. He delved into book after book after book of research on Polynesian voyaging and began to, with his paintbrush, with his paintbrush, bring history from hundreds of years ago into the present. He was finding his way. And those original paintings that he created landed in the National Geographic magazine in 1972-73. And one of them actually got on the cover of the Geographic magazine. Now, a station in Pittsburgh who was wooing me to join them because they wanted to bring the National Geographic uh, television specials from commercial television to public television said this could be a project that we produce. Well, I helped them get the geographic and helped them get Gulf money to be able to support this. And my icing on the cake was, I said, I don't want to be a manager only. I've got work to do as a filmmaker. I made Woodstock five years ago. I want to be a filmmaker. And they said, well, do you think you could handle this thing that's on the front cover of the magazine? I said, absolutely, because remember, I was brought up by Tor Heyerdahl. I was brought up by the love of indigenous people. I was brought up by the idea that the Pacific was a absolutely monumental petri dish, a testing ground for voyaging and for experimentation and for ancient technology. And I believed when Heyerdahl said that oceans are pathways, that, damn it, these islands were stepping stones on a pathway as ancient peoples were trying to find their way to spread their culture. So Herb's paintbrush was like one of those hooks that got me right here, you know, and pulled me forward. I had studied American Indians. I knew native cultures a bit. I felt that I could blend in. So, 75, I had set up the geographic in, in, uh, geographic in WQED Pittsburgh on the West Coast so that we could avail ourselves of a, a, a lot of really extraordinary people and bring National Geographic specials, the highest rated programs ever, to public television in 1975. My job then in July was now go to Hawaii. And I'd never been, and I was, I was blessed. I came to Hawaii uh, in July of uh, 75 without a camera, just to meet people. Met Herb, awesome. Met Ben Finney, awesome, entirely different from Herb. Met Tommy Holmes, entirely different from Herb and from Ben. But they formed this three-cornered stool 
this Troika of people who had founded the Polynesian Voyaging Society, and they had at that time just launched, and someone had covered it, Tip Davis had covered it with two cameras, the launch of Hokule at Kaneohe Bay. So the first thing to do was, of course, meet the people, and the second thing to do at the same time that you were meeting the people was to go on a sail. <laughs> so that was the first time you ever went on, on a sail, on a boat? On a, that was the first time, no, I had been a I sailor. Mean, but on, on one of the... It was the first time, <laughs> I mean, you know, the plane landed. A day later, I was in Molokai kicking up red dust, you know, on the streets and sailing on Hokulea and meeting the people. Was this the first time you'd been to Hawaii? First, first time, time I'd been to Hawaii. What was your, what was your um, uh, initial reaction? Uh, what, how'd you feel about it? Uh, you said you'd been around indigenous people and... Well, what was your what was your feeling about Hawaii at that point? I didn't know whether I could fit in. I am Howley. You know, who could trust a Howley looking like what I must have looked like way back then? You know, I, I had I had no idea. I th I thought from a conceptual point of view, I could learn a lot about the Hawaiian culture. I could do it by being in person with people who I met, and the people who I met were not only the Billy Richards and the Shorty Bertelmans and the Boogie Kalamas and the, uh, you know, the list goes on, the Buffalo, you know, I mean, and they were, they were all there. I mean, these guys with some funny names, I've got to say, but August Yee and Kevin, uh, Kenneth Emery and um, Paige Barber, who was pure Hawaiian, who, uh, she and I just became immensely compatible. Um, and it was both, I'm shy, and I'm on the other hand, I'm a leader. And so somewhere in between on this seesaw, you've got to kind of sort out where you are in the kind of the scheme of things. And I didn't want to be too pushy, uh, because I didn't have any idea about what I was going to do, except cover what we had contracted with the Polynesian Voyaging Society to do, which is to tell their story. Good, bad, indifferent, warts, and all. And it was earning that trust, which was probably the most difficult thing uh, about being here, being accepted, being allowed to listen, and being capable of asking questions of as many people as I possibly could to try to probe to find out how this canoe that Herb had drawn and that fundraisers had built and that Ben and Tommy had, and everybody, Chemo, had all worked to launch, what did she mean? What did this girl mean? I mean, they'd given birth, she was marvelous, she was majestic, she was beautiful, she floated on the water, she wanted to go wherever the wind took her, and even against the wind, you know, she was a navigatable uh, vessel, totally unlike what Heyerdahl had done with Contiki, but that's a whole other issue. He was a drifter, he was not a navigator. These people, I was to discover, these people who were attached to the Polynesian Voyaging Society and who had embraced Hokulea and Hokulea had embraced them were embraced for totally different reasons. Each individual brought their own baggage, their own mana, their own perception, their own aspiration, their own goals, their own paranoia, if you will, to her. And my opportunity, my opportunity was to try to track it, you know, to try to be honest to the array of people that she, the canoe, brought me in touch with. And it wasn't until I met Mao Piailug from Satterwall, who was in his inability to communicate in English, totally capable of communicating his incredible mana, his soul, his brain, his constellation of solutions, his purity of 
vision. Uh, he and I, I uh, bonded in whatever way we did, as I bonded very differently with everybody else, but there was a special bond, I think, between uh, Mao and me. Um, and I knew that, that that could be an anchor, that that could be an anchor to whatever this story was going to become. So. You uh, amazingly documented some crazy situations, including the very first when they were going around the island and they started taking on water. Uh, I'm just unbelievable that you were there to capture that. You just, I want to be able to touch on, you touch a little bit about that experience where the, where the Hokule was taking on water and here you guys are floating in the middle of the sea. And, and I think Holmes goes on a surfboard to go try to go to land. Um, it, there's something very weird about this, seeing that from, from the standpoint of thinking about what um, Eddie did. Uh, it, it's just Years later. a really weird, for me, being in this generation, to watch that, and it, that almost identical thing happened again, was, was really, tell us about that, that, that situation, being on that boat at that time. Well, we left, I mean, we had sailed from Oahu to Hanalei Bay. And there was absolutely no difficulty in getting to Hanalei Bay. It was, a, it was probably a broad run or a reach, you know, to get there. I mean, no tacking, nothing involved. We were just floating on top. Uh, I'm seasick, I mean, but I'm always seasick, so, you know, but I'm doing my thing over the side. People say, and this is the guy who's going to make this film. And, well, as soon as I get rid of it, I'll make the film, you know. But my team was with me, you know, my cameraman and my sound man and my assistant. Uh, camera guy, they were all there, and you know they were doing what they were supposed to do, and I was just doing what you allow a producer to do from time to time, which is go over the side. So, getting to Hanalei was easy, you know, and we were welcomed. Hanalei, Nick Beck, and kids, and singing, and everything else, and we were there for I'm going to say a couple of days. I don't remember exactly, um, and then we left, and we left, as I recollect, at night with the idea, and Herb was captaining. Uh, the idea was we were going to tack back to Oahu against the wind. And we started running north of Kauai between the channel and, and south, and, but we couldn't begin to move eastward. And that was the difficulty. And the reason we were was because we were, and nobody was really, really, really noticing it, we were too heavy, there were too many people on board, I was there with three of my camera team. Uh, we had our own little weight, you know, I mean, a camera and a couple of magazines and batteries and things of that kind. Uh, but we weren't necessarily the problem. The problem was that the watches were not as well coordinated. And we, in the morning, we were not very far offshore, and it was five or six o'clock in the morning, and you could see if you woke up, as I did, and looked out, and I saw down there that excuse me, but the water level and the canoe were at about the same place. And everybody was kind of scrambling to the, uh, you know, to the windward side, to the side that was out of the water. And nothing could be done, it was too late. Within minutes, within minutes of noticing this and everybody up, we were not making any progress and we were swamped and we were dead in the water. And I had told, Norris, our cameraman, Norris, do you have enough magazines? Can we film any of this? And the guys on the boat were looking at me like, excuse me, we're going down and he's filming. But my job was to film whatever was going to happen. I saw it not as a complete tragedy because you could see there was land over there. It was eight miles away, but it wasn't so far away. Um, and Daylight was coming, and I knew there was a passageway that ships would come between, and we had a couple of mirrors. I mean, it was all kind of old Boy Scout tricks, uh, and Tommy said he was going to sail, and I thought that was crazy. He was going to get on a, a paddleboard and go. What that did was it showed how vulnerable this idea was and how responsibility for what goes on aboard that canoe was only a, a, a small part of what had to be mastered if this, here it is, if this 
Hawaii voyage of discovery was going to actually take place, this bicentennial voyage. It couldn't take place under those kinds of conditions where it was as fragile as it was. We weren't threatened with loss of life. We were threatened with loss of project, you know, and accountability and issues of that kind. Um, we were towed to shore eventually. The thing came, we took some, you know, images. The biggest problem at that point was in the hands of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. Could they hold themselves together to achieve what was on the T-shirt? Could they make this happen? Not because we were under contract with them. That had nothing to do with it. Could they do it as a people? Could they work together to take it to what had to be the next step? And luckily, because they trusted me and I was there with my team and a couple of teams because I couldn't use one team consistently. I had to be the constant, but I changed camera teams uh, in order to be able to capture the struggle that went on. This was a birth, a birth, a monumental undertaking, the seeds of her birth were not millions of people, they were maybe dozens of people with a couple of core people who were involved in it, the core team at the Polynesian Voyaging Society, each one with a different kind of mission that they wanted to accomplish with the canoe. And what I then had to watch was how this canoe meant so many different things to so many different people over the course of hours and days and weeks as they tried to put the canoe back together while in effect they were really trying to put themselves back together. The canoe only happened to be something that they could lash together. Could they lash together their common missions? Could they put the cultures together so that this could work as an east-west center, if you will, you know, as, a, as an amalgam of different souls. And I was fortunate enough to be able to be there and watch it as people struggled this and tried to be honest and I probably stepped on some toes here and there and I've always apologized for them because we're all frail human beings in this struggle and births, births are very difficult. I mean, births are very difficult. They require all kinds of doctors sometimes and midwives or sometimes Babies just plop right out on the ground and you go up and you continue to do your work the next hour. I mean, this was not that kind of a birth. This was an incredible struggle. Uh, and we were lucky to be allowed in, to be invited in, even when they cringed and we had cameras, to be able to watch this. And we were used to, we knew that, to, uh, but we had to persist to see whether our canoe, our canoe would make it and whether Mao Piailug could influence enough people along the way so that everybody would be together as one family on the canoe when she finally left from Maui. That's a long answer, I'm sorry. No, no, it's, uh, you, uh, uh, there's awesome sound bites in there, and we're gonna definitely use some of that. I wanna kinda go back a little bit to, uh, um, you know, talking about a birth, you're talking about, uh, will this canoe hold the people, you know, hold together, and I'm gonna use that as sort of an analogy to holding the people together too, right? We, I think you touched on that. Um, there's different cultures involved. You had Hawaiians, you had the Haoles, you had um, the Asians. And would you say that the canoe at that early stage where Hawaiians were even searching for their own identity, that this was uh, not just a birth for the canoe and for the journey of the canoe, but also uh, for, for some of the Hawaiians themselves uh, to wake up in a way? Because so we see that in Kimo, in, in some of what he says in the film, uh, where he really is trying to protect 
the essence of the canoe. Would you say that this is sort of an awakening too for some of the Hawaiians involved? I don't think there's any question but that when Herb's brush brought yesterday to today and it sailed on water and was able to go from island to island, that every person of every ethnicity who Hokulea met were not in one way or another overwhelmed by the presence of the past in the present. And this was a very difficult uh, exchange, interaction for people to make with this relic of the past. And it brought up a lot of hostility. It brought up a feeling of Hawaiians being robbed. It brought up a feeling of Hawaiians who had never had an opportunity to really talk about their feelings of being suppressed, robbed, and it took them this long time to kind of figure out, could they talk about it? Could people look at themselves and say, I'm like the canoe, I'm a half-breed. I don't know, you know, the, she's made of fiberglass and she still looks like she should have been made out of uh, koa wood. Um, we're using a different kind of rope than we don't have senate. Uh, you know, the sails are Dacron, they're not Lahala. They're, you know, all of these things were, how do you lash it? And the arguments about everybody felt ownership, thankfully, and some of the ownership was difficult for them to be able to express, and some of them found other ways to try to express their feeling about being part of a very visible bicentennial project when they were going through their own personal torment or stuff that their fathers and mothers had told them or their aunties and grandfathers and abuelas, you know, everybody were, they all had a feeling about this. And so you had people on shore who were 80 years old looking at this and saying, my grandmother used to, so you went back multiple generations. And this assemblage of feelings, there was not a feeling, there were multiple, there were as many feelings as there were people. It was a pure Rashomon story. Uh, and what we did was we maybe uncovered a wound, or maybe we uncovered many, many, many wounds. And people like Paige and Walter Ritty, who finally agreed to talk to me, and to, he said, I won't talk to you anywhere out here. I have to go up. I have to, I have to talk to you in a private place to me because it deals with you know, my own personal feelings. And, and uh, that, to me, was the extension of trust as they were reaching their hand out, and I was really there. I was there to be a, if you will, a sponge, a fly on the wall, uh, to be able to capture what they wanted to say and somehow sort it out in the editing room, if I could. You know, if it was difficult, it was difficult. But it was, uh, there's no question that the bombing of Kaho Alave all of a sudden became a part of the film. There's no question that Ben's interest in pursuing the scientific and the compass-related issues, could she tack this many degrees, and could she make heading, and could she go against the wind, and could she go north, and could she go south? And Herb's depiction of these people with their ancient cloths and their garbs and their... Th and Mao's simple... This is what we have to do if you want to live on the water, guys. Listen to me, and if you don't listen to me, bad luck, perhaps. You know, we might not make it. And Tommy Holmes, who was just plain old fearless. And, you know, everybody else joined, and everybody kind of jockeyed for 
they jockeyed for space. Um, but it was, it was a difficult birth. It was a difficult birth. But it was a difficult birth, but it succeeded. A baby, a concept was born. Let's, um, in, in, a, in a very microcosmic way, it, that, uh, just, it, was, it was a telltale tale of what was going on at that time in the world and politics and in Hawaii in general. And, and let, me, let me just interrupt and say, I, I began this as a film about a vessel, a picture. And I discovered that the film was really about human rights that it was about civil rights, the same kind of stuff that I had been working through in New York in the 60s, I did Woodstock. That was certainly uh, an expression of what happened at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the 60s and the state of our world as it was Jimi Hendrix and his guitar. This was a, all of a sudden, it was as though the civil rights movement needed 3,000 more miles to come from the end of the 60s to get to Hawaii in the early 70s so that it could grow as a, if it was a movement, if it was a human rights movement. People began to talk about, publicly, began to talk about these kinds of issues. They might have been talking about them for decades. Who knows? I don't know. But uh, I mean, James Michener knew. <laughs> you know? Well, you took you, that, that's exactly where I was going with that. Was just the, what was going on at that time in the world, civil rights, things like that. Um, so you hit it on on the number. I was I was amazed, and you talk about trust. I was amazed at that that scene on the beach before they leave. Um, I, I get chicken skin right now, just kind of talking about it because um, that touched me. Being a native Hawaiian, the whole ponopono session that they had to have. Yeah on the beach, before they could leave land, before they could leave and, and take themselves onto the water, was probably one of the most moving moments of the film. And I was just, I was just amazed at, at, that they, one, they allowed that to be filmed. Because I know that in my, you know, father's, grandfather's era, whatever happens in that, in those circles, stays in the circles. You don't, you don't talk about it outside. And, and you don't, certainly don't let any strangers come in and document. So tell me a little bit about that, the feeling, being the fly on the wall, being this, this sponge, if you would, this really powerful moment on the beach. We knew through Capena uh, and Fred Cachola and I think even Kenneth and, and August Yee that PVS and Ben and Herb and, and actually a, a Tommy as I recollect everybody knew that the burgeoning of feeling about Hokulea had come to a to a point when chemo appeared the day before two days before unbeknownst to us uh, he was there we were there, you know, we filmed it. What are we gonna do, not film it? Uh, kind of a thing. But the struggle that everybody was going through, and when Capena said he's going to have a ho-ho-ponopona, I looked at Paige and I said, what's that? This is, this is when everybody hangs everything out to dry and they really talk to each other and they really, I said, just stay there. And so I had two camera teams and two sound teams, you know, like two cameramen, two sound, and we just hung. I, no, sorry, I'm wrong. We had one sound man, John Butler, and two cameras, Norris Brock and Joe Siemens. And me on crutches off to the side, way off to the side, I, I didn't want to be a part of it. And we just watched, and we had one assistant, Ed George, who was changing magazines because it was not digital. You, you know, every 11 minutes, somebody ran out of film. You know, yeah, and this went on for almost an hour. I mean, I don't know how much film we shot, but it was probably about two hours worth of stuff in the course of an hour uh, because we were watching everybody. 
this was the birth. The birth wasn't on Kaneohe Bay. That was so simple. That was like almost a conception, you know? This was the birth when people had to kind of come together on uh, Honolulu Beach uh, in Maui. And we were there for two or three days, and we needed that time to get ready to go on the ocean. And this was the time when Mao was instructing people. And Mao couldn't instruct people unless the Ho'oponopono had taken place beforehand. It was the release of all of the anxiety and it was the time at which everybody, the leaders, had to make a decision. And the decision had to be reconciled with by all of the other people who were going to be on, the, on, on Hokule on the trip down and who was going to go. This, and I have tears, and, uh, you know, Dave Lyman's wife is holding up her hand, you know, and she's doing this as the people are paddling out to Hokulea after. This is the most emotional moment uh, in the film, but it may also have been the most emotional moment uh, of that whole year, even surpassing the arrival in Tahiti, you know, 30 odd days later. This was the time when they had to try to come together and heal and resolve and reconcile everything that had gone before them from 600 years up through the past several months or year, because it was a year and 14 months when we left, uh, between the time that she hit the water first and, and the departure, 14 months, this was the moment. And it was very difficult. And I'm glad they allowed us to capture it, because I think that Hawaiian people, and not just Hawaiian people, I mean, people everywhere have to learn how to get along. And this was an opportunity for them to be able to talk about this and to be able to wrestle with each other and to hold each other and Kimo's dad and asking Kimo to apologize and Kawika Kapahelula, you know, the captain. Herb wasn't going. He had been the captain. Herb was not going. He had painted the picture that would take her to Tahiti, but he wasn't going. You know. This was a momentous time, and the project could have failed right then and there if they had not had this ceremony. And everybody said, we can't go because Kimo's not going to go. You know. Yeah, I mean, if Kimo hadn't reached out his hand, shake the captain's hand, and, and make that connection and make it okay. I could have just seen Kimo walking away, and, and people just would have been like... Right. I'm not going to go. Yeah. I'm not going to go, and yeah. the whole thing would have dissolved yeah. right there on the shore. It was a very and, powerful... And the water would have just come in and lapped the... Yeah. yeah. It was an unbelievable moment in that film that I think is the cornerstone. Like you said, it's just that, that, that it really tells the tale of the struggle. And like you said, the struggle has been on for years, but it's just amazing that, that whole moment. So it's wonderful. I was honored and privileged to be there with my team to be able to capture it. And that's all I can say. I had nothing to do with arranging it. I was just there at 6 or 7 o'clock that morning, and I knew it was going to be big. You know? it, was a, it was a great capture. Um, let's fast forward a little bit. So 30 days on the water, roughly. Um, from Hawaii to Tahiti. Um, you mentioned the moment when they arrive in Tahiti, and there is a little bit more outspokenness by the crew. Again, uh, there's, there's stuff that comes out, um, and, 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 and a lot of it's coming from the Hawaiian crew. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that moment and how maybe that differed from the beach on Maui. How did, how did this, this moment where stuff starts to come out, they had, it wasn't quite a whole pono pono session, it was more like a, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just let it all out, let all this stuff out. What, what was the difference? They'd been confined, there were 14 or 15 people, maybe 16 people, I think I've lost count, it could even have been 17 people on that deck 
heaving for 35 days, plus or minus, with a stop in Rayatea, or in Mataiva, sorry, in Mataiva, where for a couple of days they were brought in and that was their landfall. And in sighting land and coming ashore in Mataiva, they had obviously demonstrated everything that Ben thought was possible. And Herb, you know, the believers and the founders of the PBS were vindicated right then and there. You can sail this and you can navigate this and Mao can guide himself with the wind and the waves and the stars and the currents and the birds. And the birds came out and there's Mataiva. You know, they reeled the boat in kind of a thing rather than their finding the island. Um, that was really marvelous. And they had a chance to get on land and to kind of sort things out. But they didn't have the opportunity to really vent and vet uh, what had transpired because they were surrounded by each other. They left Mata Eva about two days after they landed, kids singing, sending them off, and they sailed on their way towards Taitiaroa. And Taitiaroa, they sort of hung for a while before they were uh, coming in to greet Papeete and all the people who were there. Uh, on June 5, and there were thousands of people. Somebody put champagne on board that boat, and that somebody was me. It was the dumbest thing I'd ever done in my life. I put a couple of bottles of champagne on board because I came from the East, and at the end of some big monumental achievement or something, people celebrated with champagne. What was I to know? How could I? I should have been smarter. I wasn't. Very dumb. And Ben got beaten up by a couple of the guys. And I'm sorry, he wasn't, you know, floored or anything else, but I mean, it was rough. And I've apologized to him. Uh, and I've apologized to everybody, you know, multiple times. The degree to which the champagne released the pain and the agony is for some other psychologists to, to measure. They had been confined and everything that had happened, it was as though the ho ho ponopono was going to continue once they hit land. Every, not everybody had behaved properly according to Mao at the end of the voyage. Mao was disappointed. Mao was frustrated that the admonishment that he gave at Honolulu Bay in Maui had not been totally listened to. So there was frustration all over the place by everyone. The main point was they had succeeded. <laughs> 17 people, two of them National Geographic photographers, one a cameraman and one a still photographer, had joined them and had documented it but they had succeeded as a human being group to make it. Nobody was lost at sea, and nobody was wounded, nobody was bitten by a shark. Everything kind of happened as you would expect it to. You'd get stuck in the doldrums for three or four days, and it would be really boring to be in the doldrums for three or four days, you know, and things would begin to fester. Why can't we get there faster? You know, all these very human, frail feelings uh, about this. But the main thing was that they had arrived and that we had 15, 10, 20,000, I don't know what the number was, but you couldn't see sand or shore for uh, an entire circumference of a mile or so of just people stacked. Uh, it was the biggest thing since Captain Cook, perhaps, or bigger than Captain Cook. Who knows? Uh, uh, it was an accomplishment. It was the first step. There was a T-shirt, which I wish I had. I went looking for it in my archival T-shirt department in my garage <laughs> at home. And it had a picture of Hoku the dog. And underneath it, that Hoku was sitting on top of the, the stern of Hokulea, and underneath it was just a 
beginning. And yes, 35 days later, they had landed, they had gone through the struggles, but it was the first step. Guys, this is a relay race. This is not a marathon. You're not over when you get to Tahiti. You've got to continue to build this movement, this wayfinding, which is what we're now describing it. Herb was trying to find his way. Ben was trying to find his way. Tommy, Chemo, Billy, Buffalo, Boogie, Rodo, Mao. They were all trying to find their way. Now they all qualify as wayfinders. And luckily, Mao had the presence of mind, and Nainoa had the presence of mind with his marvelous dad, Pinky, and Wright Bowman, and August Yee, and Wally Forsyth, and Paige Barber, and all these people who had formed the Polynesian Voyaging Society could pat each other on the back, except for my champagne, and say, you know, we did it. Now, what do we do? What's our next step? And that becomes, Tahiti becomes the launching pad of where we are today. Not exactly, you know, not exactly, because we had to go through Eddie Aikau, we had to go through Dave Lyman, we had to go through this. But there have been these times in major projects like going to the moon, and this is sticking three feet above the level of the sea around the world for three years and 45,000 miles and 120,000 people, and people making canoe models like Francis Pimmel to restore in three dimension what Herb Connie could only paint in canvas and to listen to music of Leon and Malia speak and sing to 300,000 kids about Hokulea, and for Nainoa and his extraordinary team to talk to 100,000, maybe it's 200,000 indigenous peoples around the world. That is what happens when you have a tumultuous birth, <laughs> you know? Let's, let's kind of look at, tell me about what your feelings are. You're going to be there tomorrow when Hokulea returns from his three-year journey around the world. Yeah. Um, have we come, how, how, in your mind, being there at the birth, uh, now, what is this, uh, maybe looking at uh, kid number four, <laughs> um, how does it feel? How different is it, or how same is it? You, do you think, have you, do you know that the, the, this, the, the cha I mean, obviously technology's changed. They've got solar panels on Hokulea now for communication and for transmitting video and film um, of, of that's being taken on a daily basis, which is great. This historical trip around the world. Um, what do you think about that? I think they have done exactly what Mao would have wanted them to do. If Mao died, I don't know, 15 years ago, I guess, and I have a picture of him in my home, Mao wanted people to come together by learning how to navigate the constellations that his people had grown up with and learned from. They would lie on the ground and look up and it would be heaven's mirror. And indigenous peoples all over the globe, time and time again, built sacred sites replicating constellations where they would and could do it. Hokulea is not a permanent fixture. Hokulea has sails. She has to soar. Everybody began to get the sense that you could not tie her down, that she is anthropomorphized, she is a human being, and she cries out for the Polynesian Voyaging Society to take her wherever they can safely take her in a well-organized fashion, 
and educate child after child and people after people about our place as human beings on this earth. And the mantra, this island earth concept, one ocean, island earth, is as perfect as anything. People today are learning to find their way. There are still people who are in the way of this, making this not an easy progression. It may not be as difficult a kind of a continuation of a birth as we had in Honolulu Bay with the Ho'oponopono or uh, with the lashing or not willy willy. But peoples are working together. Nainoa is an extraordinary leader, but he's the first to say he's not the only person. Everybody who is involved as volunteers uh, in this, Bruce is now coming up. Uh, these are extraordinary times in the struggle for preserving the earth and for educating young people about the path that we have to go on. So here she is, our canoe, 45,000 miles later. I don't know how many legs. I'm going to say they're probably 40 legs. I don't know whether 40 or 50 legs of a dozen people. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, there are a lot, you know, people who have devoted their lives to this. New navigators. You look at what Hokulea has given birth to herself. There were no canoe clubs. People's Hawaiian language was suppressed. They were not allowed to wear Hawaiian clothes. Doing the hulu was frowned upon. In some cases, they were taken from parents and educated according to, I'll say, Anglo or Haole customs. That doesn't exist anymore except in an isolated pocket. There are 25 canoe clubs, maybe 30, 40 canoe clubs throughout the Pacific. There are 25 voyaging canoes, six out of New Zealand, you know, who just get up and sail as a group, and they land in Long Beach, you know, from Auckland. I mean, go figure. Voyaging without technology, without iPhones, without instruments, without sextants, without compasses, without watches, is what Mao has taught tens of thousands of people to do through the vessel of the Star of Gladness, our dear little Hokulea, you know? Samoans, I mean, look at those canoes over my shoulder. I mean, there are all kinds of canoes built for different purposes. It's the, like the iPhone 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5. If you want to communicate with somebody in Satterwall, you have to use a different uh, canoe. We're harnessing yesterday and bringing it to tomorrow through this vessel. So tomorrow, Magic Island, people say there'll be 50,000 people. So take up the, the ante on who Hokulea has reached. Should Nainoa be nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize for climate? I, for one, would vote and nominate him. Should the state government of Hawaii select a new logo for its license plate and its flag? And should it be our star of gladness? I, for one, would submit that as an idea. Should Wayfinding 101 and 102 and 202 and 204 and 304 and 404 and PhDs in Wayfinding, you look at our governments and you say they need to find their way and they have lost their way. So what does she symbolize? This canoe. You know, and there are, what, three or four who are going to precede her into the harbor tomorrow? You know, John Cruz on Maui has been slaving for 20 years. He lost his wife. His son, Kepa, is alive and thriving. You know, she was on the second voyage, the voyage back from Tahiti to... There are people who have devoted their entire lives to this. 
everybody is entitled to their view. Kimo Hugo's view is as valid as Billy Richards, is as valid as Nainoa's. Leon Sue leading this whole exploration of what happened in the 1894s and 95s, the sovereign kingdom. Hokulea, this little, humble, frail, double-hulled Polynesian voyaging canoe born on Kaneohe Bay. She helped to launch these new concepts for humankind. She didn't know she was doing it. You know, she's just a little innocent bystander, you know? But that's what Hokulea is about, I think, today. And she knows that she has a journey that's part of a relay race, and she'll be part of it. And she's obviously ready and willing. She just needs to be scrubbed and polished a little bit and, you know, a little dental floss around and a little relashing here and that softball size hole repatched. And, you know, they've taken excellent care of her. She's gone into her middle age, not her old age, much better than I have, you know. She's, uh, she's a symbol for tomorrow. And she came from yesterday. And we should bless her. You know? I want to just um, ask you one, one last question. You, you mentioned that you were sort of given this assignment many years ago. But listening to you now, sounds like this has just totally changed your life. Would that be the truth? Hokulea has changed my life, too. A Howley who grew up on the shores of the Hudson River, where Hokulea did come in New York. I was with her, you know. Uh, she changed my life. I live with her. I live with her. My wife, Liz, and I live with her in Santa Monica. We have a model that's made by Frances uh, Pimmel, two feet long. We can say, good morning, Hokulea. We can say, good night, Hokulea. The first crew's names are all on the, on, the, on the front of this. We have Herb Connie paintings surrounding her so that she doesn't feel alone. She's got a Sadawal, and she's got a Marquez, and she's got a Tahitian, and she's got a fishing vessel, and she's got an earlier version of the... And I have a picture of me and Heyerdahl in Easter Island at a Moai where we spent several weeks digging because Heyerdahl and I would go on to work together in 1977-78 on his last drift voyage. He was not a navigator, you know. Um, changed my life? Yeah. Changed my life more dramatically than probably any other project. Um, and she continues, you know. She continues to change my life, and I'm just honored and privileged and humble and apologetic for errors that I made in the making of her, but I'm like everybody else on Hokulea, a frail human being trying to run a relay race. I use media, I use a camera, other people use other tools to try to talk to people. This, uh, hopefully, we can get uh, uh, your film, Voyage of Hokulea, to play again on KHT, well, now PBS Hawaii. Um, me watching this film is amazing. Like, I just, it's not only is stepping into history back, but it, it's almost like I'm, it, this is, this could play, this is like today. What do you hope that viewers today get out of your film? Voyage of Hokulea. What do, you, what do you think, what would you, what would be the hope that a viewer today, from my generation to the kids who may see it now, what do you, what do you hope they, they get out of it? I would hope that viewers today would look at this film and say, thankfully, someone was there to capture this birth. It is not fake news. This is as close to 
what happened as could be done under the circumstances with the then existing technology. I would hope that people would say that everybody who was involved in this project, even people who are not physically in the film, visibly in the film, uh, would take pride in launching what Hokulea has become. We as human beings, I don't think at the time, could ever perceive that she, the canoe, was going to take us on this journey. All we could see was the nose in front of our face, and we had to tie that lash, or we had to learn that, or we had to dry out that banana, or we had to, you know, try and get something out of the puka shirt, or we had to, you know, that's what we were looking at. She took us well beyond where we envisioned. And I think people have to look at her and look at the film as a voice. I selected Leon and Malia to compose the music. I selected Leon because he was Hawaiian and he could speak Hawaiian. And I selected Malia not only because they were married, but because she was Haole. And I wanted a representative sample of Hawaii on the soundtrack. And more important than that, I wanted Hokulea's voice to be that of a woman. And the geographic people and my team back there said, you're going to have somebody sing? I said, yeah. It's going to be the voice of Hokulea. And Malia's voice in the song that they composed with John Thomas and Jerry Tanner, the music that they composed was so in keeping with the flavor and the spirit of what Hokulea could mean, could endure to mean. Her voice, Hokulea's voice, is still that of Malia. And she will, if those 300,000 kids that they sing to all the time, if they will listen to this voice, then they will go forward. I want people to use this only as a stepping stone, not to open old wounds. I want people to use it as a, as a reveal, as a reveal of what life can be like if you're diligent and you learn how to work together and if all nations were to commit to ho ho pono ponas on the beach where there are struggles. I mean, come on, look at what this culture, and to honor Polynesians and to honor ancient technology and not to disparage it and to use respect. If there is anything that comes out of this film, it is the respect that people gave me in allowing me to document what they were going through, even though it was painful, and the respect that I tried to show them reciprocally. It is a re the values of Polynesians are just imbued with respect everywhere. And that's what this film, I hope, means to people who look at it in the future. Aretha Franklin spelled it R-E-S-P-E-C-T. It's almost H-O-K-U-L-E apostrophe A. Same number of letters, no periods, one apostrophe. I love it. I don't have anything else. You covered it all. That was a thank honor. you for the inviting me. Thank you for thank being you here today. for inviting me. Thank you. you. You covered everything I could possibly want to get out of this interview. Thank you for sharing your manal with us. Thank you for sharing your story with us. And thank you for bringing your treasures into the, the studio. Treasures, really, Francis's really treasures. It. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate your time. You're welcome. Let's uh, cut, please. Wait, wait, wait. Just oh, sorry. Well, let's get a shot of uh, the T-shirt, please. Smile at the camera. Does the T-shirt have to smile? <laughs> I understand 
that this same, this was the original T-shirt that was used to launch Hokulea. Wow. Uh, I don't, and I heard that uh, this same T-shirt is going to be sold tomorrow on Magic Island. That's now, this is not a promo for that, but I had bought a batch of the templates, and I just discovered them three days ago in my garage, saying, oh my God, maybe I could get a T-shirt made. So I did. Awesome. And that's Herb Connie's painting. And I live, we live with Herb every day. That's great. Hokulea. Thank you, Bill.